The good folks at CHRI are obsessed with reforming the police. We don't mind if it is done through altogether new laws, adapting old laws, or just making practical changes to what is on the ground. But we need improvement, and we need it now. We know our police is a big, big problem. We also know the politicians, the bureaucrats, and the police are not making good policing happen. If reform could have happened, it would have happened by now. So we, you and I, have to make it happen. We the people have to demand better policing. That is what CHRI is asking of you today. Let's work to make better policing happen. Let's be part of that change. Let me bring the police reform story home, home to Maharashtra. This is the story that every resident of the state must know when they go out to vote. When they come asking for our votes, we must ask, has the government done all it can to keep us safe? Has it done enough to protect my life, my family, my property? And has it done enough to create an environment in which we can all enjoy our rights and freedoms to the fullest? Let's first take a look at what the safety and security climate in Maharashtra looks like. Maharashtra has 165 police people for every 1 lakh population. The international minimum standard is 222. Delhi, Assam, even Jharkhand has better ratios than Maharashtra. Even here, there is a shortfall of 8,000 police personnel. On top of all this, 56% of Mumbai's police are on VIP duty when they should be protecting the public, who are also important, if we may dare to say. As the population has increased over the decades, so has the crime and the workload. Between 2002 and 2012, IPC crimes rose by 14%. At the same time, reported crimes against women rose 31%. Rapes increased by 28%. However, after the horrific gang rape in 2012, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013 was passed. The law expanded the definition of rape and added other offences against women. It also made it an offence not to register complaints of sexual offence. As a result, in one year, there has been a 36% increase in registered cases of crimes against women and a 42% increase in registered cases of rape. Interestingly, complaints against the police have also risen. Between 2002 and 2013, there was a 47% increase in complaints against the police. According to the National Crime Records Bureau, there was officially one custodial death and no rapes or human rights violations by police in 2013. This is in the face of over 7,000 public complaints against the police. Also according to the NCRB, there are no recorded disappearances of persons, no illegal detentions, no fake encounters, no extortion, no torture, no false implication, no failure in taking action, no indignity to women, no atrocities on SCSTs or other violations by the police. Each day the newspapers tell us a different story of brutality, inefficiency and public dissatisfaction. Clearly there is something very, very wrong. So, the next step is to make things better for the Maharashtra government to put in place a police that is responsive, efficient, unbiased, operationally independent and accountable. So let's see what steps the Maharashtra government has actually taken to make things better. In 2006, the Supreme Court in what is popularly known as the Prakash Singh case thoughtfully distilled the many recommendations of the many commissions that had looked at policing over the decades and crafted six clear directives that all the states and union territories of the country must adopt in order to fix India's policing problems. It was a package to be taken all together. Maharashtra submitted affidavits claiming to comply with the court's order, but this only amounted to minimal paper compliance and only for a few directives. Then in 2008, 
the Supreme Court set up a three-member monitoring committee, which found that Maharashtra was in actual total non-compliance with the directives. Finally, in February 2014, the government came up with an ordinance. This did not follow the Supreme Court's orders at all. The police made strong representations to the government against it, and so did aware citizens. Nothing worked. In June, in virtual secrecy, ignoring everyone's objections, the government passed the Maharashtra Police Amendment Act of 2014. It said this was done to comply with the Supreme Court's orders. Nothing could be further from the truth. We'd like to take you on a tour around the main features of the new law. The first directive requires the establishment of a state security commission. This is a bipartisan body intended to be a buffer between the police and the government in power. This commission filters and tempers the control that the political executive can exercise over the police. It also lays down broad policy guidelines, looks at policing plans, regularly assesses police performance and reports all this to the assembly. This is a very good idea to prevent illegitimate political interference over the police. However, the 2014 Act sets up a body but without any independent panel to select or remove members of the Commission, making any decision by the SSC immediately suspect. Its recommendations are also non-binding and is really only advisory in nature. The letter and spirit of the Supreme Court is immediately lost. The second directive ensures Director Generals of Police have a minimum tenure of two years. Through a transparent selection process, the DGP must be selected from among the three senior most officers impaneled by the Union Public Service Commission. The selection is based on the candidate's length of service, service record and range of experience. However, the Maharashtra Police Act omits the shortlisting of candidates by the UPSC, which keeps the selection of the DGP firmly in political hands without any independent shortlisting possibility. The third directive ensures two-year tenure for operational officers all the way down to the station house officer. This was intended to reduce the use of arbitrary transfers that punish the police even when they have done nothing wrong. Yet, the Maharashtra Act allows for mid-term transfers for exceptional circumstances for the public interest and on account of administrative exigencies. Even though the Supreme Court's idea was to reduce discretions and arbitrary transfers, under this Act, the police can still be shunted from pillar to post. The Court's fourth directive emphasized the need to separate investigation and law and order functions of the police. Each is a specific function that requires different skills and training. In the face of this, the Maharashtra Act does not create new and specialized crime investigation units, but rests on the plea that this is somewhat already in place. The fifth directive sets up a police establishment board. This is made up of the police chief and four of his senior most officers. Depending on rank, this board can decide or make recommendations to the government on transfers, postings, promotions and other service-related matters. The directive was intended to put management where it belongs, back in the hands of the police leadership and not in the hands of any outsider. However, the Maharashtra Act deviates from the court's composition and brings in people outside the police leadership to be on this board. So, outside influences can still decide career paths and assess capabilities when this should be the job of no one else but police managers. The sixth directive requires governments to create a police complaints authority. This is a specialist body that looks into public complaints against police officers in cases of serious misconduct, including death, grievous hurt, rape and other offences involving serious abuse of authority. The police complaints authority's direct oversight is meant to give the public a local level independent go-to place for their grievances. Instead of being totally independent to the police as the Supreme Court required, the Maharashtra Act allows it to have serving police officers on it. There is no arm's length process for appointing other members. 
and to ensure its weakness, its recommendations are not even binding. In short, taken together, the Act completely wipes out the possibilities of good policing that the Supreme Court's directives held. In fact, it embeds into law all the bad practices that are rife and keeps the police totally in the pockets of the political executive. Throughout the years when Mumbaikas had to go through the horror of the Mumbai blasts, past 2006 when the Supreme Court passed its directives, past the monitoring committee's finding that Maharashtra had done nothing to make policing better, till now when the court is again looking to see whether its orders are being obeyed, Maharashtra has resisted improvements. In the end, the state has created a law entirely biased in favour of cementing a stranglehold grip on the police. The people of Maharashtra now have a police that is still short-staffed, still under-trained, still unspecialized, and still ill-equipped to serve the people. But now in addition it has been designed to be entirely the creature of the government in power. Police planning, behavior, careers and accountability will be subject to every new government's political biases and whims. Unless we the people of Maharashtra demand a change. We have that opportunity. We need to make better policing a central issue in the coming elections. We need to ask every candidate in every public forum, what is it you will do to make the law better, to help the police be better on the ground, to make our families and our future safer. We need to send a signal that to get elected, every candidate of every party must tell us what he or she will do to make policing responsive, clean, efficient and law-abiding. What will they do to change the police from a force to a service? Promises won't do. Practical solutions must be spelled out before you get the vote of the great people of Maharashtra.